Motion capture is very different from movie stunts. But did you know that there are two different kinds of motion capture? The first and most well-known kind is known as performance capture or PCAP. This kind of motion capture is usually a contained scene which may include dialogue or a choreographed sequence. PCAP is typically non-interactive. Examples of PCAP include game cinematics and movies. The second kind of motion capture is what we call gameplay capture or game cap. Game cap involves recording a series of very short movements which are ingested into the gameplay engine as gameplay pieces. These animations will be seen many more times by the player as opposed to PCAP animations. Game cap animations for the protagonist will likely be seen thousands or tens of thousands of times each. This is why motion capture directors are very critical of gameplay performances, and performers might find themselves doing dozens of takes of a single movement, making small adjustments each time, all so that the animator can get exactly what they need from the performer to make a functional game engine. When shooting GameCap as a performer, you have to keep in mind that the developers have already designed most of the engine, and now they just need to fill in the missing spots. Sort of like a quilt missing a few key pieces of fabric. So gameplay animations have to be able to fit as snugly as possible into the gameplay engine. For this reason, the beginning and out portions of the animation have to be very precise. There might also be time and space limitations that you have to factor into your movement. The combat engine itself will also impose its own limitations, as will the character skeleton, the camera placement, future effects placement, ambiguities with the costume, and the list goes on. So as you can see, as a GameCap performer, you have a very small canvas to work with, and yet you're tasked with giving as much life and character to this movement as possible because even on the 10,000th time that the player sees this animation, it still has to look good. So since I've done some game cap for some pretty big titles like the God of War games, Demon's Souls, and the Mortal Kombat series, I wanted to share with you the system that I've devised for myself for performing game cap in a way that both saves time and energy while also giving the animator exactly what they need. So let's do an example. Say the director wants you to do an axe swing for the gameplay engine. You perform the movement in such a way that would have been fine on a movie shoot or in a game cinematic, but the game cap director isn't satisfied. Cut, he says. Fix your beginning pose so it matches the character's idle pose. Now going back to our quilt analogy, the beginning of the animation has to fit the idle pose of the character so that this animation piece can fit with the rest of the engine. So you fix your idle pose, do the rest of the movement. Cut, he says. All right, now hold the antic long. Now the antic is the anticipation that comes before the attack. Why do we do this? Well, it's more satisfying for the player to be able to see this wind up, however short it might be, before the attack is unleashed. And if you're performing as an enemy character, it's to show the player that an attack is coming. So you do that. Cut! Okay, now step before you attack. Now notice how previously I stepped after the axe swing. That's because this is a very natural way to do a simple crossbody attack, but it's not the way most combat systems work, which usually requires a step before or at the same time as the attack. Now this is always awkward for a martial artist or even a stunt performer because it's so unnatural for basic attacks. And yet it's standard because the designers need to make sure that the character hits a definite mark so that the hit can register accurately. Most combat systems, not all, but most, work this way. So you do that. Cut! Now change the hitbox to a diagonally downward direction. This might be an arbitrary choice by the director, maybe to accommodate different opponents' heights, or to indicate a different power level, so you adjust your swing direction. But you also have to keep in mind all the previous notes about idle, antic, and the pre-step while making this correction. Cut! Now return to idle with zero translation. That means when you reach the end of your attack, don't move forward. Sometimes gameplay designers will want the character to remain in place after an attack. For example, in a game that allows you to fall off a cliff, an additional uncontrolled step after an attack might send the character to an early death and frustrate the player. If the wrong foot is forward at the end of the swing, then a small foot switch gets us back to the idle. Cut! Now end the movement at the correct idle. Again, going back to our quilt analogy, the beginning and the end of the animation have to be able to stitch seamlessly into the combat system. Keep in mind that all of these notes from our hypothetical game director are not the rules for every combat system. I've worked with combat designers who preferred it when I added a step after the attack, or others where they wanted minimal anticipation. The particulars of any given combat system will vary, and these notes are only to serve as an example of what kind of particulars the game cap performer might encounter. Now this feedback process took seven takes just to get the performer to do the right movement, and this assumes that the performer is remembering all of the compounded feedback from previous takes. This is not only burning valuable time on the mocap stage, but the performer is getting exhausted, burning hundreds of calories just to get one good take. Now, if we look at the numbers here, all said and done, this shot likely required between 20 and 45 minutes. What with all the rehearsals and feedback, replaying the footage, water breaks, 
Now on a standard mocap shoot, you only get six to seven hours of actual shoot time after factoring in ROMing, lunch, water breaks, pee breaks, breathing breaks. So that means that for this one shot, we just burn between five and 10% of our entire day. We recorded a total of seven takes, probably closer to 15 or 30 if we're combining attempts in a single take, but only one was any good and the rest were wasted as burns. So that means that at this rate, we're gonna get between 10 and 20 best takes today. And at this current burn rate as a performer, I can expect to do between 200 and 600 takes. So the director might just start having to settle on takes that hit the right metrics, but aren't exactly what they want. And it's gonna cost them hours per animation just to fix them and make them ready for gameplay. So as a mocap performer, how can I both maximize the number of shots I can pull off in a day and get the director exactly what he or she wants? The answer is in optimizing this performance feedback process. Now, when I was doing motion capture on God of War, I faced this same problem every day. I'd do the move, the animators would give small adjustment notes, and we'd do it again and again and again until I finally got it. And as we saw earlier, it sometimes took me five or six or sometimes ten takes just to assimilate all these notes. And the worst was that if I was too focused on these notes, I would actually forget to put character into the movement. But I wanted this job, I wanted it so badly that I would do hundreds of takes in a day just to make sure that I could get the movements right, and it was so exhausting. If you've ever seen my movies Contour or Rope It Up 2, yeah, those were tiring days, but those days were nothing like a single day of doing non-stop game cap on a game like God of War. I actually went out and bought a Fitbit one time when I was doing a game cap shoot, and I found that I was burning around 4,500 calories per day. Naturally, I came to the realization that I needed a process that would reduce my calorie burn rate while also getting the animators exactly the movements they needed without wasting takes. So I developed a system called the five stages of movement. In order, they are endpoint, anticipation or antic, hitbox, recovery, and outpoint. So if you actually think of these five stages of movement like parts of a sentence, then you can compartmentalize the feedback all at once, like you're fixing the grammar in a sentence. Basically, I started making a grammar of movement that made it easier to break down movement into its constituent parts. If we were to go back to our director from earlier, we could have taken all that feedback, the fixed idle, longer antics, step before the attack, vertical hitbox, zero translation and proper idle out, and applied it across the five stages of movement. Fixed idle is the end point, Long antic is the anticipation stage. Pre-step is also the antic, so we can overlap those in interesting ways. Vertical cut is the hitbox. Zero translation is in the recovery. And fixed idle is the out point. So if the director came back with another round of notes, like, okay, great, make the end point more bladed, keep the left arm bent on the antic, translate with an extra shuffle, add head rage, keep the recovery alive, and snap out to a new idle, we could put all those pieces of feedback into our movement grammar. New bladed idle stance is the end point with a bent arm antic but keeping the same timing, adding in the shuffle step before the vertical hit during the hitbox, I'm adding the head rage now which is something I learned from God of War, the recovery stays alive after the attack so that the player feels like the character is really in the combat, and I'm remembering to go back to my new bladed idle in the out point. So instead of doing another 7 takes we just do one because we've grammarized movement. Then the animators can do another round of feedback, add a spin this time do a double antic, maybe change it to an uppercut and add squash and stretch. Go back to doing a post step, but now add a dragon's tail where you throw the leg out so it looks messier. Do a quick draw version as a parry with zero antic. Or add a stumble in the recovery. And last but not least, the leaf spring which Mehdi Yisef taught me on God of War where you coil your body up and release it like a leaf spring on a truck. What's really cool about the five stages of movement is that you can modify its parameters to emulate common action styles. The style I trained in was the snappy Hong Kong action style with fast and shapely antics, keeping translation to a minimum to assist in cooperating with an opponent and recovering quickly back to idle. God of War taught me the American style with its big antics, big hitboxes, and long recovery times. It sort of feels like a bar brawl where the combatant swings for the fences but cautiously returns to idle, almost as if anticipating fair play from the opponent. And working on various Japanese game titles taught me the Japanese style with minimal antics, speeding through the hitbox and posing at the recovery position. This is basically the same movement language you would use in Iaido, which minimizes anticipation. 
which you can see in classic Chimbara films as well. You can apply this language to fighting game movements like the ones we see in Tekken. Now you can play with this movement grammar to emulate Korean movements with snappy but character-driven antics, big hitboxes, and a sort of victory pose for the recovery. Or the Thai style with its fast antic, clean hitbox, and a combat-ready recovery, very much in keeping with their martial arts systems. So these are all movement languages of different regions in the world, and my theory is that these different flavors, not just the movements themselves, but the different lengths of antics, the hitbox varieties, and how the recoveries work, derived from the real combat history of these people and regions. All of these movement languages can be parsed the same way because they all share the same movement grammar. The five stages of movement is a simple framework which can not only allow you to quickly iterate on movement, saving time and money on the mocap volume, but it can also give us new insights into movement as a whole. Instead of seeing a punch just as a single punch, we can see it as an entire sequence of movement. Parsing movement this way allows us to slow down time and understand movement in a revolutionary new way.